Okay, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Hi everyone, uh, thank you for joining today's webinar, Transforming the Dread. My name is Amanda Brees. I am the Senior Marketing Manager uh, here at the Aduce Group, and I'm gonna be your moderator for today's webinar. So before we get started, I obviously just want to introduce today's speaker. So from Cornerstone, we have Manny Gervasio. She has over 15 years of experience as a regulatory compliance professional in the sciences industry. From the Educe Group, we have Jackie Nakes. She has over 10 years experience in HR information systems management for global pharmaceutical companies. And now we're just gonna go over a few um, housekeeping items. So as you might know, um, this webinar is being recorded. So we will be sending a link to the, recorder, uh, the recording later this week. Additionally, a live Q&A is gonna take place after the webinar is over. So please type in any of your questions into the Q&A box on your screen, and they may be addressed at the end of the webinar. And of course, we want you to join in on the conversation. So if you're tweeting, uh, feel free to use the hashtag uh, Compliance Insights. And of course, follow us on Twitter at Cornerstone Inc. and the Aduce Group. Now we're gonna go into the agenda. So first, we're gonna start off by going through the evolution of technology and how it's changed the way consumers behave and work. Then we'll walk you through the characteristics of the modern learner and provide tips for how to engage them effectively. Then we'll dive into the current trends in learning and provide examples for embedding compliance into your current work culture. Then we'll provide key examples for effective people strategies and we'll wrap up with a Q&A. Now with that, I'm gonna hand it off to my colleague, Jackie. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining. On the slide here, you might notice something interesting. None of these companies are available today, except for the graph on the far right. These companies, although they have changed in the last couple of years between their weight and the industry, one thing is certain, they are always changing. Companies are being acquired, some are even failing, and others are shifting their strategy drastically. You might wonder, what is it about these companies that actually impact your life, other than maybe using them or investing in them? They cause disruption. Companies are constantly causing disruption in our life today. Some of these might cause more dramatic disruption, other than go unnoticed or are items that become much more interesting in our day-to-day -day life. If you think about Blockbuster, and depending on where you're from in the, in the country, you might remember a family video. There still are a few out there today. However, you more readily notice Redbox at every McDonald's or at every corner of a Walgreens. Even better, you are now able to actually rent movies from your home device and get a better 3D experience than you might even if going into an actual movie theater. What about getting in a taxi? It used to be easy to flag down a taxi, stand outside, maybe have to wait in the rain. Now you're able to pull up an Uber on your app. Even better, Google is coming out with their self-driving cars that you order from your table and it's available. Nobody to talk to. I'm gonna just pause. Amanda, can you just tell me that you can hear me okay? I feel like I'm getting some feedback on my phone and it's cutting out. I can hear you. Okay, thank you. Technology and the influencing our expectations. Our day-to-day -day lives are influenced and constantly changing by the things that we are forced upon us. The experiences that we have when we now shop online the experiences we have finding a job, looking for an organization that we might join. Even ordering a car online now is easier because of the way that these companies and the way technology is influencing the way we do our day-to-day -day lives. This element should not be taken lightly, especially as we walk into our workforce. If we are constantly being updated and upgraded, 
with different technology and other aspects of our life, shouldn't we expect the same thing from work? Technology is a day-to-day -day influence, and I'm going to take a excuse me, and I feel like I'm going to take a step back in time to when I entered the workforce. Internet and Facebook did not exist. Now, I am constantly getting training, little video clips that I can go out and take now on Facebook, on LinkedIn. It's easier now today than ever. I should expect the same thing from work. Let's start with why do people learn? The purpose of learning is to affect and impact behaviors and outcomes. We want the information to achieve a purpose. How do I perform my job? How do I get promoted? They just asked me to be a manager. What do I do next? The purpose of learning at work for your employees should be the question that you ask. Ask yourself, how and what do my employees want to learn in the organization? What are they being impacted? How are their impacts making a difference? For most of us on the call today, this is just-in-time training due to our industry. And it's to ensure the quality of work and that the work that touches the lives of millions of people out there has a high quality and it gets done right the first time. However, consider the courses that you are assigned today at work and how do you take them. Don't harass your employees. Please sign this policy, report on your attendance. Did you take that code of conduct training? Do you know why you are being asked to do these activities in your job? Is it just to check a checkbox? Might have you skipped some of these trainings? Did you actually decide that you would participate in them or were they forced upon you? Regardless of the answer, these questions should be asked by you training and what your employees are going to get out. If this is required training, how effective is the training to individual learning styles? The world of compliance is a challenge and it should not be reviewed, excuse me, viewed as a checkbox driven culture. However, once we realize, take a step back and understand that this is what we actually are asking today is a checkbox culture, we understand we have a different problem on our hands and then we can go to solve for it with different set of tools. Does your experience deliver on employee expectations of how they learn and how they use technology in other areas of their life? Are you putting your learner's needs into consideration when you are creating training? Some do better by reading, some do better by doing, some listen and view much better than the other two. Are you given the right audience meaningful information and not just asking them to check that box? Do they understand the big picture and the impact of the quality of their work as they go through the training that they are about to take? In summary, we see these challenges in front of us. So let's take a look at some of the ideas that we have to actually move the needle. This slide is not just a generation slide. This slide is about the modern world and the modern learner. Remember that the slides about the Netflix, Netflix and Uber, Amazon, all generations today participate in those modern day activities. And those expectations of day-to-day -day life don't change when we walk in the door at work. Your modern learner wants autonomy. They are constantly connected. They're looking for more efficient ways to do things and do it right. They need clear goals, clear context, and easy access to that training today. However, we're surprised that our same methods aren't producing better results. It's like we have bought a 3D TV, but we're only offering some black and white shows. Our life science industry experience tells us that learners are completing training at a higher rate, but are they actually more effective? As you build the foundation of a program, it's important to remember the diversity of the audience that will actually be using it. Remember that people learn in all different ways on different topics 
sometimes we have to sit to learn, participate in what's actually happening. Other times we need something fast, quick, and accurate. A strong program offers all of these options and opportunities to collaborate. How you present that learning is very important. Keeping in mind how you shop on Amazon, Netflix, all provide you with recommendations, suggestions to make things easier, searching the wide, vast library of training that you actually offer. Narrowing down the training that you're asking your employees to take that is specific to their job and their actions that they are about to take is just as important. We need to make it easy for employees to find what they need to do and the context around why it's important to do it. Compliance training cannot be avoided. However, the same concepts can be applied to ensure that your learners understand the big picture to complete their training. Do they know they have options on how to take their training? Are you offering multiple types of training that deliver the same information that allows each learner with specific learning needs to consume that information? Let's not forget where we work is changing. The ability to take learning over your tablet or your phone while also having a meaningful experience while doing hands-on tasks is relative. Not all online content is mobile friendly yet, so let's keep that in mind, but it is changing and the options are expanding. Having a video available to you on a mobile device while you're performing a task can be very supportive and impact the customer on the very end when they receive an accurate product. What about gamification? Imagine you're standing on the line demonstrating how to do a task. All of your learners have a device in hand and have just watched you do the instructions. Then they're able, you're able to pull them and actually have them respond via the mobile device so that you're capturing real life information, allowing them to be more upfront about the types of questions that they're going to have. And you're getting the pulled information that is now tracked and available and it's real life. Maybe step away from the quizzes at the end of an instruction, a checkbox, a did you learn, did you not learn, and actually provide real life examples and performing those tasks with your gamification now. What about wearables? These are things that we used to think are of the future are really right around the corner. Now, I don't have to take a course on how to lift a heavy equipment or to perform things safely. I now have wearable patches that actually zing me if I'm holding the box wrong or I'm performing the activity incorrectly. Any, anyone find anything strange about uh, the quote from Abraham Lincoln? Don't read everything, don't believe everything you read on the internet. There's actually quite a few quotes that Abraham Lincoln supposedly talked about the internet. Most employees are trying to find information all over the web about their training. And we need to make it easy for them to know where inside of your LMS library it is that they should actually be diving in and finding the accurate information to perform their jobs. Mandy will discuss later, but please note on this slide that 87% of respondents want to share their knowledge. We have subject matter experts in the industry now, in your company, that are willing and able to share these jobs with their peers. Are you diving in and actually collaborating with those folks who have the experience? Asking them to start helping and performing activities that surround training. When surveyed international leaders, the number one thing they said was important is to be sharing their knowledge with their team. That's where they're receiving information. And although number two, I would say searching the web for resources, let's not believe everything we see on the internet. Very low on the totem pole do you see job aids and e-learning training. Additionally, let's take a step back and look at, there was a recent Economist article that came out just regarding the lifelong, the learning of a lifelong individual. 
Experience is meant to be acquired on the job, but employers have actually been spending less and less willing to invest the training in their workforce. Advisors have found that in this country, in the US, workers received either paid for or on the job training had actually fallen between 1996 and 2008. The graph here shows that 10% of development actually occurs through formal training like classrooms or e-learning or books. 20% is done through observation, mentorships, coaching, but 70 actually occurs on the on-the-job experience, putting your hands to the product, even doing problem solving. However, we out of your budget today, 90% of organizations are actually spending more money on that 10% than in anywhere else. That is a problem. We need to be shifting our thought and our focus, and Mandy will dive into that a little bit later, but spending more of your focus on that 70% where memory and retention is actually retained as opposed to only viewed once, take an exam, and passing it. And if we go to this next slide, which I love this graph, I use this quite a bit, is the Evan Health forgetting curve. So you will see that the time that you actually spend learning and the immediate recall dwindles over the time. So after 30 days, and if you think about our SOPs and how they usually are effective within 30 days, how are you ensuring that your learners are actually retaining that information when that SOP becomes effective? Are you providing them more hands-on, really retaining that information if you think back to that graph just before this? Mandy is gonna dive more deeply into how the compliance industry is actually changing and what you should be doing with your employees. Mandy? Thank you, Jackie. Hey everyone, um, as Jackie mentioned, I'm going to take a little bit of a deep dive into uh, compliance, some key things that we have to keep in mind when we work in a regulated space, um, regardless of what, what space it is, it may be life sciences, it may be something like, you know, banking, financial, uh, aviation, government job, et cetera. Um, regardless, um, every, every industry has a specific set of compliance um, you know, regulations that we must abide by. They're essentially what I call um, the cost of doing business. So there is an upfront investment that has to be made in things like aligning with regulations in order to do business in certain um, specialized niches. So they're the non-negotiables, um, you know, <clears throat> I have actually, in my experience, in my life prior to uh, joining Cornerstone in my current role, came from a life science space and um, got to see, you know, you know, real life what happens when you have sort of breakdowns in some of your compliance areas. Um, it's not fun. It can lead to significant, uh, significant things such as regulatory penalties, um, you know, product recall. Um, in, in the case that, that I'm speaking to, it, it actually went to a consent decree. It was working for a rather large uh, biotech company when it happened. So, you know, again, it's one of those things that you ha if you work in the space, you have to take very, very seriously, and you have to, you have to align, you have to develop programs that support um, industry standards. In terms of compliance from a high level holistic perspective, there's four key areas that I like to kind of call as sort of the landscape, the general landscape to consider. Things like effective processes and procedures, um, focus on competency development, as well as monitoring, you know, and, and that's, you know, that means many things internally, many processes, um, you know, your controls that you have in place, as well as continuous improvement. Now, continuous improvement is, is kind of something that I really enjoy and I've spent a lot of time doing in my career. And what I have found is there tends to be, especially in the life science space, um, a lot of focus on continuous improvement when it comes to, you know, our manufacturing processes and kind of 
streamlining things and focusing on lean initiatives and operational excellence, et cetera, focus again on process and infrastructure. However, I, I think that very commonly that same focus is not always put on things like our core HR processes and things like learning and development. So as just as technology is constantly evolving and, you know, if you're manufacturing, you know, a sterile product, you know, you may want to build out a new suite and install all the latest, greatest equipment and kind of improve and streamline your processes. Um, well, we need to give that same level of, of focus to, to training and to developing our employees. And as Jackie mentioned, it's such an evolving world right now with technology is is forcing and driving change, whether we like it or not. Um, so in terms of giving our employees the right tools so they can be successful, we have to adopt some of that stuff in order to be effective as an overall organization. So something focusing on, um, you know, learning and development and continually improving upon that is just as important um, and will lead to, you know, success in different capacities um, as we would on in improving our infrastructure. And that to me, um, again, is just my personal experience. Um, I've worked on a lot of continuous improvement projects in the past and, you know, my previous life, and they were around things like, um, you know, new equipment, uh, new process lines, and things like that. But from an HR and learning and development perspective, I think the same amount of focus and emphasis should be around how we train and develop our employees. Um, yeah, my, my background truly was life sciences, biotech, um, pharma, large, small molecule before uh, my current role, and I know very well that it's a constant, constant evolution. It's always changing. Um, the regulation, the competition in the market, just there's an incredible amount of pressure to adapt if you want to persevere, if you want to stay in business. Um, so that first slide that Jackie actually opened up with, you had the companies on the left that, yep, they're no longer operating, and you have the companies on the right who are some of the, you know, the groundbreakers, like, you know, especially like the Googles and, you know, Airbnb and, you know, Netflix and those sort of companies. They're innovative, and they're, they have focuses on evolution. Um, so I think that it's something that in less, you invest in that, then you know you're, you, there's it's, it's essentially you're not you're not able to maintain your position in your space um, without that without keeping that in mind. And with that being said, um, you you have to place a strong focus on talent development. Um, again, you know if someone works in in the pharmaceutical space and they're particularly talented in their role. Um, they're going to be looking for development opportunities. Um, you know, they, we want to see in the workplace the same types of tools and resources that we become accustomed to using in our daily lives. Um, it's just one of those things, I think, Jackie, you mentioned kind of the 3D TV that's available you work, that you're using at home and then kind of coming into the workplace and using really kind of outdated technology and, and, and having types of training that really aren't effective in truly developing you in your role, um, people become sort of discouraged by that. And it's sort of, it, and it definitely is a vehicle to lose talent if you don't sort of adapt and get on that sort of evolution train. Um, again, talking about specifically um, the regulations, I mean, Scrutiny is high. It's probably higher than ever. I've been in, um, well, I entered the life science world back in 2000 and 2001. And just thinking back, that's roughly 15, 16 years ago. It's incredible how much that has changed since then. Um, I remember when I first started my very first real job, um, we were actually submitting our, our BLA for our first product, the vaccine company I worked for. And I just remember I just finished new hire orientation. I was sitting in, in my cubicle and I was watching these three girls just for days on end, you know, carrying boxes to the to the printer and making thousands and thousands and thousands of copies of documents. And then I finally asked, you know, exactly what they were up to. 
and it's because they were putting the packets together for the filing. So to think back now and see how, how much that has changed with, you know, electronic filings and, and just everything, it's kind of incredible. Um, so again, it just lends itself to the fact that, you know, operating in, especially in a life science state, there is an incredible amount of scrutiny and an incredible amount of pressure to constantly maintain a benchmark standard, have the top level technical SMEs in, in, in place who are in the know in their specific technical niche. So whether you're a validation expert, you work in tech transfer, you're a quality control analyst, you need to be abreast of what are the expectations. For example, if you, if there's a, a brand new um, sterility test that you know, companies in your same market are, are implementing, well, you need to get on the train and also do that. But before you do that as a company, you have to have employees appropriately trained. Um, so again, just kind of speaking to sort of maintaining that competitive edge. And the way you do that is with your employees. Your employees are your most valuable asset. Um, it's people who do things. It's people who make decisions. It's people who execute processes. Um, so we have to, you know, we have to appropriately, um, you know, give them the tools to be successful um, in the end so we can be successful as an organization. Um, now, saying all this is, you know, sounds easier than it may be in theory. Um, and fundamentally, what I think is that programs that I've seen in terms of compliance being most successful um, is when it's truly embedded in the culture. Um, I've worked for places that have had an incredible amount of focus on compliance and training and employee development. I've also worked for companies where it just wasn't necessarily a high priority. And I've seen the success or lack of success in both realms. So companies who saw compliance as just as much of a priority as making sure our infrastructure was top notch were the more profitable companies, the more successful companies. They weren't the companies that were in the news for anything negative in terms of the brand. They weren't necessarily having product recalls. They were some of the um, most reputable companies that actually worked for. So that, again, um, focusing on employee training and development is definitely it hits the bottom line, right? So, so it's just something that I think leadership, um, if it's acknowledged and bought into, they see that, it, you know, you're going to see the impact. Um, and in terms of how do you do that, I mean, it's really sort of multifaceted. Ensuring you have the right fit, the right people on the right task. Um, I know sometimes, you know, people might sort of initially get hired into a role based on maybe academic potentials and, 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 you know, enter kind of the position, it, it may not always seem like the best fit. Well, okay, there could be a couple of reasons for that. It may truly not be the right fit, or it might be there needs some additional development and some mentorship that needs to happen to make them successful. Um, there's an, there's a, an inherent expectation that if you're an SME in your department, that you understand and you actively benchmark against other companies and you, you're in the know. Um, again, and, and able to do that, companies really need to provide the resources for employees to, to, you know, to stay abreast. So what are some strategies to sort of maintain company attraction and kind of attain all the different things that I mentioned? Um, you know, be sort of best in class in your space, have high-functioning, high-contributing subject matter experts. Um, excuse me, experts. Um, one thing that I truly believe in, and it's something that um, I've actually been a part of and I found to be incredibly effective, um, is the concept of re-honeymooning your all-stars. So what does that mean? So you may have some folks that have been at the organization for a while and they're acknowledged and they're kind of your go-to people. If you're a manager, it might be sort of your right hand, um, that, that person that's always kind of, you know, in the details, able to step in immediately and, and add positive impact. Well, those, that's great and, and, and I'm sure a lot of that is acknowledged, but as Jackie mentioned earlier, 
um, the most effective training is, is when people fundamentally share knowledge, right? So that sort of idea of mentorship, uh, mentorship and, and different cohorts and things like that. Um, my, my first sort of uh, understanding of the concept of lean or operational excellence was actually in a situation such as this. Um, I, was at, um, I was at a company, um, had been probably there for like maybe three or four years, was kind of in a groove in my role, um, kind of had that piece down, and there was an opportunity to, there was a, a request for a volunteer from the quality team to help with an operational excellence project. And I felt, oh, I have the bandwidth. I, 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 I don't really know much about it, but I'd like to learn, and um, was awarded the opportunity. And it was just tremendous, the impact it had on me and just, just you know, how it kind of developed me for the future and how much more value I was able to add after that project. You know, I ended up through that getting a green belt in, um, you know, in OE from, from, that, from that company and, and, you know, it was just great. Again, and, and the other part of it is sort of cross-pollination because it was a cross-functional project. There were many people that um, I had not met before and, you know, it kind of siloed to my working in quality operations at the time and I met people from manufacturing and validation and, you know, quality, you know, a analytics and all kinds of, you know, different areas. And I guess the, the bottom line is it made me more effective. It made me, it, it made me a, a higher contributor to the organization after that project. So I think that um, those types of opportunities are invaluable and, you know, it, it it, it's, it's only a benefit when leadership um, buys into things like that and is able to, um, you know, give their, especially their, their high potential uh, talent, uh, those types of opportunities. Um, there's always a plus side to it in the end. Um, when you have people, then they can operate much more broadly than they, they were able to prior to uh, being involved in different projects. And, you know, so in terms of cross-training, you know, it's, it's key to have responsibilities and roles be very clear. Um, you know, having, having transition periods, if there are certain projects that you'd like one of your folks to work on, um, but they still have responsibilities in their current role, you know, there, there needs to be kind of clear boundaries, clear understanding of exactly what the task at hand is, et cetera. Um, because, you know, at the end of the day, if someone's hired for a certain job function, that job needs to, to also get done, but I don't think people should be restricted. I think that mentorship and that on-the-job training, that 10%, that's the most critical for development, I think that needs to be um, truly acknowledged and bought into by, by, by key, key management and stakeholders um, if they want to see additional value, um, uh, you know, um, an output from, from their high contributing um, folks. Um, another thing that I think is very impo important to bring up is the idea of progressive, progressive skill, skill requirements. So just as technology is advancing and we're, like I said, revamping our, you know, uh, purchasing new equipment and designing new manufacturing suites and investing in, in all of those things for a product or a service, um, the same, the same goes for, for training and employee development. So if you are implementing new technology in the organization, then there needs to also be focus on, well, how are we now going to make sure folks who are involved in these processes are adequately able to support them? What type of training is that? I highly doubt just reading an SOP on a new piece of equipment or a new process is going to be 100% effective. There needs to be more, okay? That's a great starting point, but there needs to be more of that, that hands-on um, mentorship type of training to really make it whole. So some strategies in terms of prioritizing learning. Um, again, so often, I think, and some companies are great at, great at doing this and, and may be a little bit kind of ahead of the curve than others, but um, establishing learning as a priority, just as something like having zero product recalls, you know, I mean, it has to be also 
just as high on the radar and bought into as the company culture, just as anything else, um, in order for you to really see that tangential impact. Um, and you will. I mean, it, it, when, you, when employees are given the appropriate tools and resources, um, it, it, would be, it would be shocking that you're not going to see a positive impact, right? So um, there's different things that you can do. And I've lived most of these strategies real life and, and, and can authentically say that they have absolutely helped me 100%. Um, you know, having, having a manager that is actively involved in your career trajectory, helping you set very clear, actionable goals, and monitoring them. That's the key piece, monitoring them. It's not like coming in, you know, January 1, setting your performance goals for the year, because HR says you have to, and then kind of letting them linger until you're supposed to get your annual review. I mean, that's simply not going to be effective. You need active engagement. You need a manager also who's willing to put in the time and work with you and guide you. And another idea, which is just amazing, especially for leadership development, is stretch assignments. Most people want to be challenged, especially if they're invested in their role and they like what they do. Most people want to advance. I don't know many people, I'm not sure that I even know one off the top of my head that is, you know, career driven that would tell me they don't want to be stretched, they don't want to learn more. I mean, people, people genuinely, I think, want to do a good job and they want to be challenged because it's incredibly rewarding when you are given something very new and very different and maybe even somewhat intimidating at first and you succeed with it. So again, there, there, is, there is a necessity to have that support from your manager, leader, mentor, you know, whatever um, you want to call it, but as an organization, you're going to see some really, 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 really good, you know, value coming out of it if you invest that time up front. And just for some numbers, um, everyone loves statistics, and from our cornerstone, we do some career trend reports. So 74% um, actively monitor trajectory of their career by setting goals, um, you know, and a small percentage use online, online tools to do so. So again, in the, in the world of technology and using performance um, systems now that probably, you know, makes things much easier, um, for managers to kind of have these plans defined and, and you know, um, and have a tool to do that monitoring and tracking. Um, but even if you don't have a system like that in-house, obviously it's just fundamentally, it, it's, still, it's still feasible to, to do that, um, to do that as a practice. Um, and also, you know, if, if that is something that you're engaged in as a manager, I mean, definitely, you want your employees to know that you're watching um, and that you're there for guidance. You're there to coach them because, I mean, even some of your, your best employees, you know, your high contributors, your really technically adept uh, SMEs, you know, need help. Everyone needs coaching, anyone. I, I, would, I, I would tend to say there's probably not one person in the world, no matter how successful they are in the role, that doesn't need coaching in anything. So, Again, I think coaching is key. It builds confidence. Um, you know, when people feel supported, it kind of brings out a different side of them. Um, and, and people actually, if they, if they are, you know, looking to step into, you know, leadership or kind of take their career to the next level, um, they want to work hard. They want to learn more. But again, that guidance and that coaching and that mentorship is, is really, really critical to allow them to get to that point. Um, and I kind of can't, can't necessarily emphasize that enough because um, I've, I've, seen, I've seen people grow leaps and bounds in their careers by just giving a small opportunity to stretch or learn a new technical area, having, you know, being in the sort of um, under the guidance of a great mentor, I've seen them just kind of excel in just extraordinarily. Um, and tying that, this is kind of interesting. Um, you know, some people who are very sort of bottom line revenue focused, um, some kind of numbers around that that are pretty interesting, but not surprising to me. Um, so 
companies that actually define and agree on leadership competency because they're essentially built to the, to the, to the corporate culture and this is how they do things from sort of an HR, L&D perspective, see one and a half times higher revenue growth. Um, companies who have made talent a key focus of the culture have actually seen 2.6 times higher revenue growth than companies, um, you know, who don't make this as a priority. So, you know, I mean, it's, it's absolutely kind of, you know, fast that if you invest in your people, you are going to see a bottom line impact. And I can actually, you know, think of an example in my career where, um, you know, we, uh, training was defined in an area that needed um, to be improved upon, especially for certain key technical areas in the organization. So there was sort of this big initiative to revamp training. It was actually for, uh, for, manufa for sterile fill area, sterile fill manufacturing. And um, after about a six month initiative for all kinds of sort of, it was real focus on um, on the job training. Um, also some external external training, sending some key folks to some benchmarking seminars, et cetera. We then tied that to deviation trending because that area had an incredible amount of deviations. That was really the key issue for us from a quality perspective. And it had dropped off something, it was something incredible, like 70 something percent reduction in deviations that we saw. saw um, Post that you know that training initiative. So again, um, this stuff really works. It really truly adds value to the organization. And just as we focus on continually improving our infrastructure and our processes and being more efficient, we need to have that same amount of focus on our people to to allow them to be successful with the right tools um, that fit this time and era. Um, so. Again, you know, having uh, training available, you know, just in time and, and, and things that accommodate people in different roles aside from just sort of the policies and procedures which are necessary and, and, and also great reference material, there needs to be a bit more um, to truly add to that, that overall effectiveness um, as an organization. Again, so uh, just a couple more numbers here. Investing in development, interesting. 32% said there isn't, there aren't enough employees to do the amount of work, and also 38% say that their employer provides training and career development. You know, that's not very high, right? So I would like to see at least over a 50% statistic in, you know, showing that people have this available and they are supported. Um, in ways to, to develop their skills to be successful. Ultimately, if you have successful people that really understand their role and can add value, you're going to be, add more value as, as a company. Um, and, and it's just pretty simple math. Um, also, assessing for fit. So 40% of hiring teams um, assess for fit in, in the pre-hire pre -hire process. Um, and just a, an example, Xerox alone was able to reduce turnover by 20% with this, with this technique. And, you know, as we all know, turnover is incredibly expensive to a company. You don't want to have to, you know, keep hiring new people. I mean, the money that goes into that, of course, again, impacts your revenue at the end of the year. You want to have really talented, high-contributing folks that, stay at the organization and grow and then cross-pollinate and translate that talent, you know, or those, those, those knowledge and skills to other people and mentor them. I mean, and just sort of the circle goes around. I mean, truly to, to maintain a competitive niche in the industry, that should be kind of the ultimate goal. Um, so, said probably a lot <laughs> in a few minutes. Um, not sure if there are any specific questions about that. Um, sure. So thank you, Mandy and Jackie, um, for presenting. Uh, we have about 15 minutes now, so if you guys have any questions, um, feel free to type them into the Q&A box on your screen. Um, additionally, I just wanted to call out um, some upcoming events. So you guys, if you are Cornerstone clients, you might be aware of Cornerstone Convergence, which is happening in two weeks. Um, it's from June 5th through the 7th in San Diego. 
So obviously, if you want to learn more about it, feel free to visit the Cornerstone website. If you are planning on attending, uh, please stop by the Juice Group booth uh, number seven and say hello. So with that, um, I have a couple of questions right now. Um, so Mandy, one question I have is, how do you organize organizations successfully make learning a priority, and how does that innately become part of cooperative culture and landscape? So my, my, my take on that is it's truly that it has to be a, sort of a top-down buy-in. You truly have to have leadership in place that fundamentally believe that talent is critical to their viability, you know, in the, in the space. Um, and, and just for an example, um, one small startup company I worked for uh, a few lives ago, um, they were incredibly invested in, in learning and development and just employee growth and retention, right? They did not want um, to be a company that constantly turned people over and, and also lost really good talent to their competitors. Uh, so their new hire orientation, it, it was right out the gate, you, could, you knew that they, that was their focus and it was a priority for them because there, were, there was an entire day on compliance and training. There was an entire day on um, risk-based decision-making. And that's actually kind of part of my, my academic background. So I was like, whoa, this is pretty cool, you know? Uh, and it, it was something I also had not seen. I'd been in the workforce for some time, and I hadn't seen that as part of the new hire orientation. But I will tell you, um, Everything that happened in that company that was truly employed through those types of philosophies. We used we used risk management to make decisions. We 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 didn't just make decisions without data. It was always like a risk based approach that made us effective. That made us um, that that helped us you know maintain revenue because we weren't we weren't you know having issues with product because we were making solid decisions. And also, we were training people appropriately to be able to um, do those risk assessments. And, you know, and, and they also sent people, um, if there was any topic area that was relevant to your role in some capacity, and there was an external uh, training um, or, you know, conference, et cetera, you wanted to go to, I did not see anyone ever get turned away for those requests. And actually, they really promoted it. So. You know, for me, you know, I was working in like um, QA, uh, QA operations, you know, product dispositioning, and you know, I was sent within the first few months to go attend uh, a three-day seminar and sort of the best practices for, you know, for product dispositioning in DC. And it was just like, you know, it was if you said no, because I saw some, there were some people who didn't particularly like to travel much. Um, they were asked to go to certain certain trainings, just kind of maintain the benchmark, meet other people, hear what other people are doing, just, you know, help us stay abreast of the latest, greatest practices. Um, and when people did not want to sort of do those offsites, it was sort of discouraged. Um, but ultimately, as a company, we saw very minimal things that you see in other companies, like, you know, getting recalls, that's a big one, or uh, rejected product lots, because Ultimately, I would say it was a very well-trained staff. Um, so again, to, not to, to kind of get into it too much, but um, the short answer of it is I think that, that, that sort of executive management buy-in, that that is a priority of the culture and that is critical and we do focus on that. Amanda, this is Jackie. I I'd like to just add to that because I think what Mandy said, the top-down approach is very important. I think as well as the change management and ensuring that while large organizations um, like life sciences tend to be are very decentralized with the way that their training is administered, having a core governance structure that also has emphasis on the change management, that training regardless if it's learning and development or compliance, all has the same type of focus and is, is driven from all of those areas of the organization. And that really does impact that culture to make it the same playing field regardless of the type of training. Thank you, Jackie. Um, so I actually have a question for you. Um, what recommendations do you have for more engaging compliance training, such as SOPs? 
This is actually one of my favorite uh, topics to discuss because in recent times, you know, we have standard operating procedures that that's not going to go away. A read and understand document is critical to the type of training that uh, we provide. However, people learn in multiple ways. They learn with hands-on video, listening, demonstrating, um, fixing a problem, you know, creating a poor bottling and asking someone what happened, what went wrong here, is can also be just as effective for them to learn. Teaching people is another great way for people to reiterate, reemphasize that knowledge themselves. So I would I would tell people to, you know, start looking at supplemental training um, and enhance, you know, training that can only enhance the SOP that they are, um, you know, trying to get the information across. And it's more about that they understand the activity, the task, and they do it well. And reading something and comprehending is not, everyone does not always learn that way. Thank you, Jackie. So it looks like um, that's it for the questions. So just before we conclude, I want to remind everyone that we are recording this webinar and we're gonna be sending it out later this week in an email. So with that, I wanna thank Mandy and Jackie for presenting today. And I wanna give a special thanks to all of you for joining today's webinar. We look forward to seeing you at our future events and webinars. Have a wonderful afternoon, everyone. Thank you.